for the live stream request, um, our justification is the same as last time, as in the other team from our school got live streamed and there were a lot of insulting attacks on them. So we don't want that to happen.
It's totally cool if everybody's not ready yet, but just before we start the round, I'm gonna read a quick content warning. Our case discusses genocide in Yugoslavia and Rwanda. It doesn't include any graphic descriptions whatsoever. It just uses the word genocide. It's nothing that isn't in a history textbook or a newspaper article, but if it's gonna make the round an unsafe place, I'm gonna send an anonymous opt-out form and we're gonna change the terms if it's something that's less sensitive. Um, um, I'm gonna leave the meeting and come back, but I'll be right back. Okay. Even if you're okay with it and you'd like to opt in, just fill it out so we know. And um, so like our case also discusses the same topics. So um, if it would be fine, if you could just tell us the, like the result of the form, then that would also work for our content one. Does this mean you both are like consenting to it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Congratulations on making it to semifinals, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're just waiting for the last judge, but when that's in, we can just like set up an email chain. We're probably good to go. Okay, so I will let you guys know something just up front. So I had a surgery not too long ago, and usually I can wait the entire time before using the bathroom, but right when the last final focus is done, usually I have to go immediately. I hope that's not the case, but I don't really have control over that currently. Just so you know, I'm not trying to like, all right, bye, but it's like, I'm in a lot of pain, but <laughs> I also need the money, so I have to judge. <laughs> so just so you know, but I will write very detailed notes if I'm not able to stay super long. But I'll be here the entire debate, so don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> okay, I'm back, sorry y'all, I was having some technical issues. And then me and Steph are good to go when y'all are. Um, did everybody fill out the form? Could you send it one more time just so that I can fill it out? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay, awesome. Um, just for the other team, we got five yeses. So I think that everybody should be good. Um, in that case, does everybody wanna drop their emails and I can start a chain? I don't need to be included on the email chain. I'm just gonna go based on how you guys address one another's arguments. Awesome. Um, if you can include me on it, I won't read any evidence unless you like explicitly tell me to in either uh, a speech or like crossfire, um, but it just makes it easier at the end if that happens. I just sent it and I think I got everybody, but just let me know when y'all got it and I can start. All right, in that case. Yep, I got it. Awesome. Is everybody ready? Great. 
We negate. Our sole contention is genocide. Step point A is Bosnia and Herzegovina. The IMF facilitated the breakdown of the Yugoslav economy in two key ways. First is economic mismanagement. As memes in 1999 writes, so while earnings have been eroded by inflation, the IMF ordered the freeze of wages, causing them to collapse by 41%. This was coupled with the devaluation of the dinar, leading to another round of price increases. Inflation soared at 1,134%, pressing everyone out of goods and tearing the country apart with the richer provinces, objecting to being drained of resources by the poorer provinces. The second way is through resource allocation. Michelle Rice, the IMF controlled the Yugoslav Central Bank. Its tight money policy further crippled federal Yugoslavia's ability to finance its social, economic and social programs. State revenues went into to service Serbia's debt instead of being evenly distributed amongst republics. By cutting the financial arteries between Belgrade and the republics, the reforms fueled secessionist tendencies that fed on economic factors as well as ethnic divisions and virtually ensured the de facto secession of the republics. The IMF paved the way for Croatia's and Slovenia's formal secession in June 1991. For these two reasons, Beams continues that Yugoslavia broke into pieces as ethnic and religious rivalries were reasserted in such a controlled decline in economic conditions. Reforms caused massive and repeated strikes and labor actions, eroding the social fabric that individuals had come to rely on. He concludes that Yugoslavia was a functioning state until the IMF took over economic policy and genocide, right only after shock therapy done its work as people resorted to tribalism after the IMF's disgraceful loading practices sent the nation into utter chaos. Devastatingly, the civil war that followed the IMF's meddling resulted in a devastating genocide. As History.com writes, the Bosnian Serb forces, with the backing of the Serb dominated Yugoslav army, perpetrated atrocious crimes against Bosniak, Bosnian Muslim, and Croatian civilians, resulting in the deaths of 100,000 people by 1995. Step point B is Rwanda. The IMF laid the groundwork for the Rwanda genocide in three key ways. First is marking consolidation. Maloney in 2017 writes that in the 1980s, the IMF encouraged coffee exporting states to expand their production. As a result, the coffee market was extremely saturated and the price completely collapsed. In Rwanda, the oversupply of coffee meant that the price collapsed caused the government's budget to be cut 70%, leading to a reduction of spending on social services. The oversaturation of coffee also meant that Rwandan exports declined by 50%. As a result, thousands of Rwandan farmers lost their livelihoods. This directly produced the genocide as Maloney continues that SAP conditions on Rwanda's coffee industry created incentives to join the army and the Interamway militia, leader of the perpetrators of the Rwandan genocide. Further, the economic destabilization incited by SAP fueled social tensions, which precipitated the outbreak of the genocide. Thus, he concludes that 1980s SAP has created the economic and the social conditions that accompanied the beginning of the genocide in Rwanda. Second is armament. Tuesday 19 of CADTM writes, the launch from the IMF made it possible for the government to pay for the massive purchase of weapons intended for the genocide. Military expenses increased threefold between 1990 and 1992. That's because the IMF allowed Rwanda to submit old invoices for imported goods in order to pay back loans, allowing them to make weapons purchases. They also did not expose the existence of bank accounts that Rwandan government had in foreign banks, on which there were substantial amounts of money still available to buy more weapons. The IMF couldn't have cared less. In fact, the American-controlled IMF was happy Rwanda was buying American guns. She was saying, continues, they should have stopped their loans in 1992 when they learned the money was being used to buy weapons, and they should have warned the UN at once, but they went on supply and support until 1993, helping a government commit genocide. The third way is through privatization. IMF privatization measures exacerbated ethnic tensions, as Hochschild in 2020, 2012 explains, that SAPs demanded increased support of the private sector and cuts for the public sector in order to spur economic growth. Therefore, the perception was that the Tutsis were favored by the SAPs and many Hutu elites in the public sector for to lose their employment and subsequently their influence. The impacts were absolutely devastating as the genocide took 800,000 lives in just 100 days, and the war that followed took hundreds of thousands more. The damage done by the genocide transcends borders, as COP in 2019 writes that the perpetrators of the genocide, along with their weapons, retreated to what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, contributing to attacks by armed groups in eastern Congo. COP concludes that these attacks have caused millions and millions of people to continue to be killed in the last 25 years. Thus, we negate. So we'll call for some cards, but I'll put it in the chat just to um, keep track. In here.
I think we're going to call for a lot of cards. So if it's easier for you to send everything versus picking out all of these, we can do that too. But either way is fine. Yeah, we can just send everything. Okay. Are y'all going to call for more? Um, um, I was, but I do think it's eat faster for everyone if you just send it now. I'm going to send it all. Okay, everything's sent. I'll let you know when we get it. I got it. Um... I got it as well. So we'll take a little bit of prep. I'll mute myself for now, but I'll hold up my phone and start the timer. That was one minute. Okay. Um, so let me see. This is not. I'm not going to spread, but um, it's going to go like decently fast. So if you need a speech dog, I can get that in the cards after. If you, everyone, good. We affirm our first contention is South Korea. Kwan 07 explains that the IMF has been crucial in financial liberalization and global globalization trends. Kwan finds that the IMF's $57 billion bailout was the linchpin actor to disarming South Korea's financial regulations and ushering in full financial liberalization. This liberalization had the benefit of economic restructuring. Mario 13 explains that before the IMF loaned Korea, the economy is dominated by conglomerates called Jables. In the 1980s, Jables grew to become multinational businesses beyond the control of these states, exposing weaknesses in governance. Crucially, Dean finds that the Jables pushed the economy into economic crisis. Corrupt politicians sold all major government projects to Jables in exchange for large payments. Under this corrupt structure, the domestic economy experienced fast growth, but did so without the traditional growth, growth in manufacturing and innovation. Thus, the Korean economy lost its competitiveness. Due to a lack of technology, the Korean export base crumbled and the economy underwent structural stagnation. Luckily, Mario 13 finds that the IMF stepped in. Through the 1997 bailout, the IMF implemented regulatory framework that globalized the business environment. For example, IMF reforms opened the Korean stock exchange to foreign investors. In addition, the Korean government was pushed by the IMF to pass legislation mandating corporate transparency. These reforms are highly effective. Joe 19 quantifies that the post-IMF reforms non jable entry into markets increased by 15%. Thus, Dean finds that breaking down the jable system was a prerequisite to Korean economic competitiveness. Without reforms, Korea would have been trapped under Jable rule, which ultimately doubled poverty rates to 19%, equating to 10 million Koreans. Um, wait, Dean furthers that the Asian debt crisis started with the fall of the South Korean economy. The World Bank finds that prior to the crisis, almost 345 million uh, people went into people were in poverty, and Ramesh finds that the poverty rate um, almost doubled after the crisis. Our second tension is Turkey. Box 18 explains that, uh, that America provides aid when they want their allies to do something. But for countries that are not allies of the United States, IMF loans replace aid because they're more politically tolerated by the American public. Stone 04 continues that the IMF loans were traded in 1990 for Turkish support during the first Gulf War. In exchange for lending, Turkey allowed the United States to use its air bases to launch offensives and even provided additional troops. 
Sayari so in 97 finds that such support was crucial to an American victory by shutting off the twin pipelines that carried Iraq's oil exports and uh, permitting U.S. use of Inkerlik Air Base in southeastern Turkey for strikes into northern Iraq, Turkey played a key role in the campaign, campaign against Saddam Hussein. America's victory in the Gulf War was crucial for protecting the Kurds, a minority group prosecuted by Saddam Hussein. Yafei 15 explains that had Iraq succeeded in claiming Kuwait during the Gulf War, he would have controlled almost as much of the world's crude oil reserves as Saudi Arabia does. With so much money, Iraq would have had a free hand in expressing Kurds and in settling Kurdish areas. In the last Kurdish genocide, PBS 11 quantifies that over 182,000 Kurds were killed. Struve 21 continues that without the American victory in this war, Iraq would have committed a mass genocide of the Kurds, amounting to 35 million total lives lost. Our third contention is the Baltics. Jonas 14 writes that the IMF played a key role in transitioning Baltic states from a controlled economy to a market economy through structural economic reforms. SADAC 98 continues that implementation of reforms was a prerequisite before these Baltic states could join international organizations such as NATO. Mueller 2002 confirmed that as Baltic nations successfully liberalized, they were gradually invited to integrate with Europe through NATO. Baltic ascension to NATO was crucial for preventing massive conflict. Mearsheimer in 1990 predicted an apocalyptic Eastern Europe. Indeed, the Russian threat meant Baltic powers had incentives to acquire nuclear weapons. The caution and the security that nuclear weapons imposed would be missing from the vast interval in unregulated, unregulated Europe, increasing the chance of miscalculation in war. Mearsheimer concluded that the most likely scenario post-Cold War was further nuclear proliferation in Europe with large first strike incentives. Luckily, NATO expansion prevented this global catastrophe. Grants 19 analyzes Mearsheimer's predictions from 1990 and explains that NATO expansion ensured American support to Europe, kept Germany at bay, and disincentivized, uh, disincentivized Russian aggression in the Baltics. A nuclear conflict in Europe would have killed upwards of 100 million people, as LaRoque 81 explained. Can I see your link evidence on your second or your third contention? Yeah. I... Is it cool if I went to the bathroom really, really quick? Yeah. Maybe I can make you some. Okay, um, the cards are sent. And one of the cards is an image. Um, also, it's really long, so you might want to get to click like view entire message. Okay, I'll let you know when I get it. Okay. Um, also, did you send like all your case cards or just the ones we asked for? All of them. Oh. Okay, cool. Okay, I got it. If it's cool with y'all, I'll read during cross. Okay. Um, Are you cool to start cross? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna start telling you now. On your first contention, what exactly would you define as Chabal's not dominating the sector anymore? Sorry, say so that again. You're saying like, like the IMF stopped the Chabals from dominating the eco the economic sector. What does that mean? Like, yeah, what so does it mean they don't? Work? Anymore. Yeah, so before the Jables dominated the sector in the way that they, um, there were a lot of corrupt officials that they were able to bribe and convince to make risky investments. Um, specifically, the investments only went into the private sector. But now we see that the uh, there's more regulation on the Jables system, and so there's less like of the same risky behavior. Can I have a question? Wait, wait, so it's not about Jables decreasing, it's just that their power decreases? Um, that and also there's regulation on the economy. Wait, what? There's regulation on the economy, like so, SAPs. Oh, oh, so your argument is that SAPs, okay, okay, awesome. Well, it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah, that, that's cool. You can read your SAPs box, but it won't apply. <laughs> okay, can I have a question? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about Yugoslavia. So what, so you basically talk in your first sub point about how there's like increased tension between the poor and the rich, right? Sort between of. Between in Croatia and Bosnia? Not really, it's about a wage freeze. Okay, where do you talk about the rich and the poor being the separated? Second, the second. Okay. okay, so in your second some point, you talk about the rich and the poor being separated. Were the rich and the poor, was there like a wealth division with, uh, between them before the IMF stepped in? Not enough to cause a genocide. What is not enough? 
at the point at which like, so there's like how much was the increase? The increase was that not only was there disproportionate allocation of resources, but the richer provinces thought that the poor provinces were draining the resources from their provinces, which is what caused the incentive to commit the genocide in the first place. Yeah, that, that was part of the... That incentive didn't exist before because the drainage didn't happen because the IMF didn't control the central bank. But can I take a question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so on your contention about Baltics, what's the warrant on NATO expansion stopping like all that war? Um like the Soviet Union doesn't want to attack Baltic countries if the US is supporting them? Can I have a question? Well, what? That's not a warrant. Article 5 of NATO says that the US is able to use nuclear weapons. No, no, on... no I, I know why, but why, why didn't they just like, like, why does that matter to Russia? Because Russia doesn't want to be nuked by the US. Wouldn't that happen in either situation if they nuked first? No, because why, the, why would the US care about the Baltic states if they weren't in NATO? Can I have a question? Well, aren't there so many other nuclear powers in the world that are tied to alliances? Like who? Like anybody else in Europe. Who supported the Baltics that had nuclear weapons? I'm not sure. We can bring that no up. No one. Can I have a question? Sure. Okay, so on Rwanda, you say that there's SAP conditions that convince people to join the military. Which were these? So they weren't, so it's two things. A, uh, crosses over, but I'll just answer your question. A, Rwanda went into every single coffee exporting country and told them to expand their production, which collapsed the Rwandan economy. So it wasn't just SAPs in Rwanda, it was their conditionalities on every single country's exports, which caused Rwanda's primary export to like literally collapse because nobody cared about it anymore since it was oversaturated. And that basically just meant that like the entirety of their like the Rwandan farmers had an incentive to join the military because the Rwandan government okay. is the one that like perpetrated the policies. Okay. Uh, framing down the case. It's time also on my first word. Where should we flow the framing? At the top of your case. Okay. Genocide comes first as Katz argues that genocide disables the moral inhibition. Person-specific mass murder raises these stakes from individual denouncement to group dehumanization. Secondly, Okab in 2020 writes that the official recognition of historic cases as genocide is not a matter of semantics, only a sharp focus, unlike current public apathy is in, on the early signs of genocide can help prevent the crime from occurring in the future. The IMF was in early warning sign so condemn it now. Thirdly, the NAG solves that this lesson continues every contemporary citizen cognizant of a specific ongoing instance of genocide, regardless of where in the world it's a bystander, even the most remote bystander is the only source of hope left. Neglecting to do something about genocide carries a message that the action may proceed. That means that anything besides a firm rejection of institutions who have perpetrated genocide in this round allows its uniquely dehumanizing traits to compound in other regions of the world and justifies past genocide like also remember that genocide is still killing millions right now, so it outweighs all of their arguments on time frame. Go to South Korea. Turn it. The Asian financial crisis was because of the IMF and Stiglitz rights, liberalization occurred before safety nets were created and those who lost their jobs were forced into poverty. The IMF destroyed economic progress by removing capital controls. And that's why Lee in 1999 argues that the removal of capital controls increases speculative investments, sparking greater exchange rate, rate volatility because these investments are built for short-term payouts. They don't contribute to real productivity growth. And that's why empirically Greenville finds that the IMF was the root cause of the financial crisis in Thailand, Indonesia, and Korea. And because economic crises preclude access to basic necessities, in 2013 terminalizes that IMF programs resulted in 500,000 deaths annually in Africa and Latin America. Obviously, this outweighs on scope because it's in multiple countries. Also, they don't give you a terminalized impact. On poverty, Hickel in 2014 explained that after the IMF miserably failed to address the crisis, they lowered the poverty line in order to create the illusion that IMF free market policies decrease poverty when in fact there has been a 353 million people increase in poverty. On nuclear nuclearization, first, um, yeah, never mind. On Turkey. Turn it. Urbina in tw uh, 2001 finds that U.S. concern for Kurds extends only to those being attacked by Saddam Hussein and not to those being attacked by U.S. ally Turkey because the U.S. wants to keep the base. That's why she finds that over the past 14 years, more than 23,000 Kurds died at Turkish, hand Turkish hands. When Turkey sends weapons or thousands of troops over to attack the Kurds across the border, the U.S. quote, looks the other way. The IMF is an organization that acts in U.S. interests, vote neg to condemn this behavior. Second, this is not the only case. In 2000, the House was voting on a resolution to recognize the 1915 Turkey's 
ambush ma massacre of an estimated 1.5 million Armenians. Once the bill gathered support, Turkish officials threatened to end U.S. access to um, I, I, I Kirk. So President Clinton per per persuaded the bill sponsor to drop it. This proves that the airbase was literally just used as an as an excuse to commit more gross human rights violations as they impact out to. But then the link is backwards. The IMF didn't set up a relationship with Turkey. This relationship was always about a Cold War security context as Birkin in 2021 finds Turkey initially turned to the West largely as a reaction to aggressive post-World War II, sorry, post -World War II uh, posturing by the Soviet Union, receiving support, including an airbase and missile defense systems. That's the Congressional Research Service in 2020. Then turn it. Turkey is responsible for a lo lo looming genocide. A string of military operations have been systematically killing Kurdish people in Syria. The Turkish military operations are part of an extermination policy against the Kurdish population, which includes the purging of Kur Kurdish politicians, journalists, and activists in, Turkey's, in Turkey. On the Baltics, first, their evidence never says that countries want to go to war, just as that they want nukes to bolster their defensive position. Secondly, the World Bank probably could have given the reforms as well. Thirdly, miscalc is super, super unlikely. Hotlines solve already. Nuclear hotlines have allowed global superpowers to communicate about the usage of nuclear weapons in times of crisis and thus have deterred nuclear war in South Korea. Also, I would say that no country ever wants nuclear war because of mutually assured destruction. destruction. They know that it's going to kill a bunch of people and they know that it'll probably cause retaliation, meaning that they're never actually going to do it. That's why nuclear war weapons have been around for such a long time. And that's why like all of these debate impacts have existed for so long about nuclear weapons and policies have been passed and nothing has ever happened. Finally, you always prefer our case over their case because even if the IMF quote unquote prevented a genocide in one region, they still started genocide, which links into our framing. Okay, um, can I call for the for the first response in Baltics? Oh, sorry. No, I don't need to call for that. That was, yeah. Um, can I call for the turns on Turkey? Yeah. And Soka. And sorry? And then the frameworks. The framework. um, I want to turns on C1. The turn on C1, sure. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so basically turns and framework. Yeah. Sana, can you get the framework? I'll get the turns. The and if we could... Cards. What? The rhetoric of the framework or the cards? Uh, both, actually, because I caught some things I kind of missed. Sure. Do you want the rhetoric of the responses, too? I sure. think we're fine. Oh, we're not. Okay. I mean, if it's easier for you to send it, that's okay. No, I'm good. Okay. Let me know if I missed out on anything. I'm pretty sure this is all it. Oh, and you wanted the turns on C1? Yeah, just all the turns. It said, yeah, let me just. Sent. Okay, cool. I got it. Um, I did not, so let's wait. Okay, I just see the framing. Is there more? Yeah, I sent everything. Um, I think I got everything. Ooh, let me get my turn.
Okay, that was 145, so we have 15 left. So I will start on framing, then go down our case, frontlining, then their case. Anybody not ready? All right, my time begins now. Start from the framework. We'll concede to the framework that genocide is really important, but there's a couple of implications. First, they have to win that the IMF is a unique cause of both the genocides or either of the genocides in, in order to win an impact. And also, we have two links in the genocide. The first is on our second contention about Turkey. We're saying that we prevented the Kurdish genocide using the IMF. And the third one about Baltics, because if you prevent a nuclear war, you prevent multiple genocides from happening. As long as we win one of these, we can outweigh on magnitude because our numbers are way bigger than anything they have on scope. Now, let's go on our first contention about South Korea. They try to read a turn, saying that there was liberalization before. They just don't understand the history. There were two rounds of liberalization. The one, the first one was under the Jables. That was really bad because the Jables had really high risk investments that caused the Asian financial crisis. That's Marilla 13 that they don't contest. Insofar as that's true, the financial crisis was already underway when the IMF stepped in, but the IMF stepped in with a $57 billion bailout. And that's why Marilla 13 concludes that that's the reason why we have financial stability right now. And then they also say that people went into poverty. Yeah, people went into poverty because of the Asian financial crisis, but the Jables started that and they don't contest it. They don't get any offense off of this. Our C2 about Turkey. They say that the US is really bad and that's why we should vote us down. But the resolution is not talking about what the US whether the United States is good or bad. We're saying the IMF. We're saying in that specific instance of the Gulf War, the IMF loan was the linchpin to as to why the US was able to use that Turkish base and that Turkish base was necessary to win the war as Savari 97 says, they don't contest this. Insofar as all their responses are saying US bad, US doesn't condemn, it's not related to the IMF, we can still win our impact because they also don't give you a reason why their responses outweigh. Insofar as we prevented a genocide of 35 million Kurds, even if they try to say that some Kurds are still dying, they never quantify the impact and they also never weigh, they still don't get any offense here. On the third contention, it's really, really Really, really they screw up because they don't have that many attentions. Uh, they don't have many responses here. They just don't understand the tension tension. We're saying that Russia was posturing against these Eastern European states, and that's the reason why they needed to join the IMF, however, the pre uh, join the NATO. But the prerequisite to joining NATO was by joining the IMF so that they would liberalize these policies. And that's the reason why the US was able to protect these states from Russia was because they are part of NATO. If they weren't a part of NATO, then the US wouldn't have that strike back capability and Russia would have taken them out. They say the World Bank, the World Bank wasn't even there in that time. They also say hotlines. These hotlines didn't exist. And third, MAD doesn't apply here because the Eastern European states that Russia was targeting didn't have nuclear weapons to begin with, Russia would have done as a first strike. Now let's go on their contention. On their first contention, first sub point about Bosnia, uh, about Yugoslavia, there are so many non-uniques. Strom takes out their entire case when they say the IMF is not the cause of Yugoslavia's dissolution. In fact, Croatia and Slovenia seceded first from the Federation, even during Tito's lifetime, because there's always been substantial north-south divisions in Yugoslavia. Strom further that dissolution was always inevitable because the Croatian Slovenian political elite decided it was more beneficial to abandon Tito's Federation. IMF, IMF merely facilitated arranging loans to countries who have balance of payments difficulties and no adequate foreign exchange reserves. The dissolution was caused by mismanagement and dissent. The implication is that absent the IMF, Yugoslavia still would have crumbled. Then they talk about resource extraction. We would say that there's other regional actors in the bank and regional actors in regional actors and banks that could have done the exact same thing. But you should just take out this entire sub point because it's incredibly non-unique. There are so many other reasons why there's going to be this dissolution in the first place, including ethnic conflict, which they do not address. Now let's go into the second sub point about Rwanda. First, you're going to non-unique it because SAPs are non-unique. IAPS in 98 explained that the U.S. designed and was a reason for SAPs. Without the IMF, the U.S. would have done the same policies to the financial institutions like the Inter-American Development Bank as they've already done. In fact, Pandofelli 15 writes that the African Development Bank also gave out SAP loans in the 80s with the exact same conditions as the IMF. All of their links rely on these SAPs being really bad, but insofar as they're non-unique, they don't provide a unique reason as to why these SAPs wouldn't have existed. But as for the coffee, Story 01 gives you the justification why the agricultural sector for coffee collapsed for other reasons like chronic shortage of land and rapid population growth. The IMF is not the sole cause of this. As for the military spending, Nelson 16 finds that there's explicit link between IMF program participation and reduced military spending in autocratic countries. In fact, military spending is often on the chopping block when countries seek IMF loans. And then they talk about trade liberalization being really bad, but the World Trade Organization would have done that anyway. That's Amico 20, because the World Trade Organization has undisputed international legal authority to make certain policies related to the, these resources. And then they try to read that um, they try to read the IMF is a cause of the Rwanda genocide. That's not true for three reasons. First, adjustment isn't responsible for already existing inequitable system of charges and subsidies that disadvantage the primary sector, the sector that's most concerned to the poor. Secondly, the World Bank actually argued for the correction of these imbalances. A 1993 World Bank report explicitly called for a substantial rise in the current expenditures, but Rwanda did exactly the opposite. And even if you do believe structural adjustment caused all these problems, is the World Bank who did it. So this would happen with or without the IMF. In all, the entire case is really not unique. Can I see military spending? Yeah. 
and sent. All right. Um, I'll let you know when I get it. Okay. I got it. Are you going to take prep or would you like to start cross? I'm good for cross. All right. I'm going to timer. You can have the first question. All right. So, <clears throat> why does it matter if the United States would do SA? Okay. If SAPs are individually bad and like the IMF used SAPs on countries, why does it matter if the United States would do it too? Isn't the IMF still bad for implementing them? Mm -hmm. So you're arguing that the IMF is the sole or one of the main causes of the genocide. No, we're that's arguing what you're that, No, we're arguing that the IMF contributed to the genocide and that's uniquely bad because you need to reject all okay, institutions. The IMF yeah. But absent the IMF, we would say that everything you talk about would have still happened. Yeah, and the and the World Bank functionally the World Bank functionally does the same thing as the IMF. Yeah, the World Bank is bad too, but this resolution is whether or not the IMF is good or bad. And I'm telling you, since the IMF was involved, it's bad. Right. But you can take a question. Yeah, but then your framework talks about how it's really necessary to prevent genocide. You rejecting the IMF doesn't prevent your genocides from happening. Yeah, it does. Right. Our bet lesson card specifically tells you that when you reject institutions that perpetrate genocide, you allow it. You you like send a signal that it can stop occurring. But you can take a question. Yeah, sure. Okay, so you talk about how in Rwanda, it's the SAPs from the IMF that forced like Rwanda to do all these cuts. So is, is it specifically the IMF? Yeah. Okay, if it's just the IMF, why does your card also mention the World Bank, US, France, and Belgium? Well, it's specifically the I IMF and the World Bank. Like, it doesn't matter if the, for, first of all, okay. The World Bank mostly does long-term infrastructure loans that aren't as binding as the IMF, meaning that the only like short-term loans and financial market advice comes from the IMF. Second of all, even if everybody else did it too, IMF is still bad for doing it. Like, I don't really understand. Yeah, of course. Like, that. you can argue that IMF bad. I'm just wondering, what is the scope of the IMF's impact? Because insofar as this genocide would happen without, without the IMF, I don't think they're a really big factor. I don't think it would have because again, IMF programs are more binding and are like go directly through the government. They're like funneled through the government and they give more like holistic economic advice about the market flows of the entire globe okay, yeah, and our I, coffee. I, I, it's good. Yeah. So okay. I would say that like the other loans are like kind of pale in comparison. They pale in comparison. How, what's your justification for that? I just explained to you, like the World Bank doesn't do the same direct loans that have as much conditionality as the IMF. What does as much conditionality mean? We read to you like evidence that says the World Bank does exactly that. No, but the World Bank does more long-term infrastructure projects. They don't funny funnel money directly to the government, which is the reason why the genocide happened. Okay, sure. You have a question? Uh, yeah, sure. So why does extinction equal genocide? Hmm? Why does extinction equal okay, genocide? So genocide, um, well, we can talk about the definition of that. Like it's mass murder of an entire race of people. Can we agree on that? No. Okay, what's your definition of genocide? I would say that genocide involves A, moral intent, and B, a power imbalance between two different okay. things. I think that you need to value humans right. the same so, way before you evaluate util, so extinction can't happen, okay. or like you shouldn't evaluate extinction with genocide. Okay, I'll quickly respond to what you said, because your question was like like 20 seconds before. Um, so Russia wanted to take out these Eastern European states with a nuke, so that's multiple genocides at once, even if you try to claim it's general. So that's all. Okay, great. We'll take prep and I'll hold down my timer.
Okay, we're stopping prep. Um, Jessica was timing. I got 2.30. 2.30 seconds left. It's gonna go framing our case errors. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm just gonna set up a timer and then I'm good to go. The round is already over at the point at which they concede Jessica's analysis that you can't, that according to our framework, which they concede, you can't vote for an organization that, that, at, that at any extent perpetrated some type of genocide, which means that even if they solve back for one or two, your non-rejection of that organization causes the action to continue to compound in the real world every single day, which outweighs all on time frame because A, the, the conflict is still happening right now and killing millions, but B, it accounts for every single genocide if you don't reject it. Let's extend it. You're prioritizing genocide because those that know the genocide is happening or has happened to not to take action against it or bystanders who Villas and argues allow genocide to keep happening and compound in different situations all around the world. Villas and argues that not acting is still acting and neglecting genocide carries a message that the action may proceed. Let's look at some of their responses. Their first is that they're preventing genocide. Firstly, you could go back to the response that I told you. Either they're preventing, preventing a gen even if they're preventing a genocide, it doesn't matter because the IMF independently calls on what is a reason that you must, which is which, which according to our framework and they can see to it, is a reason you must, re must reject it. Also, just get that out in their case. On their second, or, or on their second of an argument about how a nuclear war leads to genocide, that's simply not true. And there's no warrant as to why it's true. Genocide is defined by its incentive because one ethnic group takes out another ethnic group because they view them as subhuman or there's a power imbalance. The power imbalance it, oh, and that incentive didn't exist with Russia because Russia didn't want to kill all of the East Asians just because they were East Asian. It was because they wanted more power. Let's go to our case. On our, uh, we'll concede the non on uh, Yugoslavia. On Rwanda, it's really, really clean. Realize that our second link is functionally conceded and it doesn't rely on SAPs at all. You can you can group all of their SAP responses and they're not responsive at all. You can send a link. The Jusain evidence is conceded and it tells you that the IMF by directly funneling money to their government allowed the Hutu minority to start a genocide against the Tutsis in the country. The IMF new weapons are being stopped out did nothing leading to a genocide that close to 800,000 people. The, their only response that applies is that military spending goes down. Realize you can look at their evidence. It's specifically from the IMF and an author named Gupta and all IMF and almost all half IMF employees um, state that like all IMF articles are written according to IMF house views and people are fired if they write anything else. But also it's obviously not true in this case because the military spending did increase and the IMF hit it. At that point, you can go to their case. At the top on South Korea, they can see that the IMF caused a financial crisis. Their only response is that liberalization didn't happen under the IMF, it happened under some, something else, but they extend the new, they drop the nuance of our response. The liberalization occurred before safety nets were created, and so those who lost their jobs were forced into poverty. The IMF discourse economic progress by removing capital controls. That's really important because work will say that everything about the chables happened, but the only thing that, but the thing that was most important was that the chables, the issue with the chables was made worse because of the IMF. Then on their second attention, really, really quickly, they can see the impact defense that um, the airbase was using as an excuse to commit gross human rights value, uh, violations. Then really quickly on our case, I just forgot to respond to defense about the World Bank. The IMF specifically set up the lending institutions that allowed the weapons to be bought to so the World Bank doesn't matter. But then on their third contention, A, their evidence never says countries go to war. It just says that they want nukes, which is conceded out of rebuttal. But then secondly, the World Bank could have done the exact same things and these reforms as well, which they concede you. They said that the World Bank didn't exist this, but the IMF and the World Bank were created at the exact same time. That makes no sense. It's a really clear neg ballot. Okay, so um, we're going to take the remaining, I think we have like 20 seconds left. Okay. Um, the order is going to be on the framework, our case, weighing their case. Anyone already? 
start off on the framework. Once again, we can see the framework. We're okay with it, but we actually solve. That's for a couple reasons. First, they try to tell you that they solve for genocide, that if they are able to solve for a genocide, then that's the reason to vote for them. However, we're going to explain later, or like if they prevent a genocide, or like if, if they win that the IMF caused some sort of genocide, then that's a reason to vote for them. However, that's not true because as I'll explain on their case, their whole case is totally non-unique and there's other attributable factors as to why they come to their conclusions. So they never actually solve. If they don't have full solvency per their framework, they don't win the debate. Then they also try to tell you that there has to be a power imbalance. Okay, sure, that's exactly what our case talks about. It talks about a power imbalance between the Soviet Union and Russia and these other Baltic countries. That's why Russia wanted to launch nukes on them. That's the mainstream evidence that they continue to concede through every single speech. Then they also try to tell you that there needs to be some moral, like, like moral, uh, there needs to be some like imbalance between these two countries. However, why does it matter what the intention is? All we know is that there's genocide on both sides. Like there, there's, ma there's multiple people being killed. Why does it matter what the intention is or why they want to do it? It's the end result. That's the reason why their framework, honestly, their framework is pretty utilitarian. Then let's go to the place where you're going to be voting for us on our third contention about the Baltics. You can extend it cleanly across the flow because they only sent two responses in the last speech. First, to try to tell you that the World Bank was already there. No, literally look at our cards. It says the World Bank was not there and not giving loans. But second of all, the reason why Latvia joined the IMF was because they were given special drawing rights. The World Bank literally doesn't have special drawing rights, so they can't give the same thing to them. Then they also try to tell you that these countries didn't want to attack. No, the Mearsheim evidence says that there was a first strike incentive created by the tension in the region, and that's why the Soviet Union wanted to attack these countries. But since they joined NATO, they couldn't attack because they were so scared of the United States. They, those are the only responses they can extend in the last speech, um, which means that we, if we win the link, we win the um, impact that 100 million people would have died in this impact scenario. You're going to weigh this over their case for a couple reasons. First on scope, because our case is literally about multiple genocides in multiple multiple East European countries. But second of all, that's going to outweigh on. But second of all, even you cannot compare two forms of oppression, right? Like you cannot say one genocide is more important than the other. That's why that means that you have to default to scope and weighing our 100 million over their negligible or, or, or over their smaller amount of lives. Then none of their case is attributable directly to the IMF. Literally, their cards concede in case that there's other institutions that cause the same thing. So you're going to see that since they don't have any non-unique in our case, and they don't attribute anything to anything other than the IMF in our case, we win the uniqueness debate. Then, let's get to their second tension about Rwanda. A couple of key things they concede. First, they concede the story evidence that tells you that the World Bank gave the loans for these countries. They say that the IMF spent, sent up the, set up the lending institutions. Sure, that's fine, but they didn't set up the loans in the first place. The World Bank was the one to do it. That's why their own evidence concludes that the World Bank, France, and other countries literally contributed to the Rwandan genocide and contributed to these loans. That's conceded analysis because it means that other reason, there, there were other reasons as to why the Rwandan genocide happened in the first place. That means that they don't win their full impact. They win some marginal um, amounts of the IMF being attributed to their impact. While they don't read any sort of uh, other like factors as to why our impact happens, which means that we automatically win these debate because we're the only one that prevents a genocide. Even if you want to buy both cases, we outweigh on scope because it's literally multiple races being um, wiped out by a nuclear war. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I ask? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm gonna start telling now. How would Russia, Belgium, France, um, the World Bank would have loaned if the lending institutions didn't exist? That doesn't matter because- Okay, we would say the World Bank literally is a lending institution. If they give out loans, they are a lending institution. That's what our scenario one evidence I meant, says. I meant lending structures that were created by the IMF. So how, how would it- Wait, so that would concedes it, the fact that you only have a marginal access to your impact. Yeah. Does it matter? Okay. Okay. It's fine. Okay. You can okay. see the okay. right? I can also respond to this. The other response that you draw is that there's a bunch of other regional banks that all have their own lending structures. The IMF didn't create these. It doesn't use the same structure for every single bank of the world. Okay, yeah, literally there's the African Development Bank in Rwanda. Firstly, you conceded that none of the loans would be possible if the structure wasn't there because the structure is what hit it from the international community, which is what's always been the nuance in our case. But secondly, and most importantly, our framework never says that we need to win that the IMF is the sole cause. Our framework just says that we need to reject all institutions that perpetrated any type of genocide. And in your own speech, you said that we get a marginal impact, which according to our own framework, which you concede, okay. means that we win the right, round. Right, right. But my analysis was that since we both link into your framework and we both link into genocide but then the don't. judges you don't don't. nuclear war Wait, can I, nuclear can I war finish? is absolutely right. not can I, finish? Yeah. can I please okay. finish so insofar as we both claim that we link into the framework that's a wash which means that the only place the judges can vote is where there's marginally the most impact which is our case because you never tell me that there's other attributions as to why we reach our impact okay, okay. can I ask a question so if 
you tell me that nuclear war is genocide. So what's the difference between war and genocide? If you're telling me that Russia is like pa- being more powerful than the country it attacks is genocide, like what? How do you differentiate? Yeah. Okay. So I can explain that. Russia specifically wanted to attack these Eastern European countries, and they were going to do that until the IMF stepped in because the IMF creates a liberalization that allows these Eastern European countries to join the NATO. They want to attack the Eastern European countries because they didn't like the Eastern European. Okay, great. So yeah. you're saying, okay, this is almost down to semantics. Why is mass murder any better or worse because of the moral intention? Also, you say power imbalance. You say okay. either moral intention or power imbalance. We no, power no, imbalance, I, so we link in. I said not only does it to be a moral ambition of you trying to kill the other person of like committing mass murder because you view them as lesser than you, which you conceded to. You said it doesn't matter, but that's the only reason genocide can ever be differentiated from okay. all other types that's of. That's just the word. You're just like different. You're just like okay. Yeah, genocide is different from the, the word. Definition of genocide. At, at, like again, my and question is. It. Why is ma- okay? Why is the mass murder of thirty-five, like a hundred million people, less important if the intention was not to wipe out your race, even though it clearly was? You just said it. You just said it. That's why it's not as bad. And you conceded our framework. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not as bad to kill a hundred so million people not, specifically yeah. based on the country. Well, it doesn't link into the framing, which you conceded. So we're not like that's, it, that's, not, like, that's not okay. the debate that we're having anymore. You told me in summary directly that it's either power imbalance or the moral intention. No, I said both. I said both. All right, framing my case, their case, the turn on Turkey if I have time. Or actually, my case, framing their case, Turkey. Genocide cannot happen without weapons, and that's why you're negating. Extend our second link. The two saints evidence is conceded. It tells you that the IMF, by directly following money through the Rwandan government, allowed the Hutu minority to start a genocide against the Tutsis in the country. The IMF knew that weapons were being stockpiled, and yet did nothing leading to a genocide would kill close to 100,000 people. They've conceded the framing, meaning you're always prioritizing genocide first, but they've also conceded the nuance of a frame that tells you that even if an institution stops future genocide, the fact that they perpetrated genocide means that they need to be rejected because rejecting genocide in all instances stops it from compounding the future, meaning that we're not only accessing our own time frame, but we're accessing their impacts because their genocides happen after. Then they say that the World Bank did it too, but they've conceded that you cannot have a loan without a loaning institute, without a loaning instrument that like shields loans from other international communities and like the unique part of our, our, our case is that the IMF shielded all of these weapons transactions from the international community, which allowed them to keep buying weapons. At that point, you know that the IMF directly contributed to genocide. But even if you buy that the World Bank did it too, this question, this resolution is asking whether or not the IMF is good. I would say that the IMF is bad for contributing to genocide as they concede. Then they say that nuclear war is equivalent to genocide, but they've conceded that genocide needs to be A, one group treating another as subhuman because of their race, and B, have a power imbalance, not either or both. Then on NATO. Their front lines on NATO would have been really, really great if they were in rebuttal, but they've conceded that countries never want to go to war anyways. It doesn't matter. They said that they wanted to attack, but they didn't want to att- like attack with nuclear weapons because they've conceded that countries know that in every instance of nuclear war, everybody will die, meaning that they're never going to like use them. At that point, they've also conceded that the World Bank could have done it too. They said that their evidence isolates for the IMF. It doesn't matter. The World Bank was probably still there too because they say that the World Bank and the IMF loan in conjunction themselves. On Turkey, this is another place to vote for us. They've conceded that in 2000, the House was voting on a resolution to recognize the 1950 Tur- Turkish massacre curve an estimated 1.5 million Armenians. And once the bill gathered support, Turkish officials threatened to end US um, access to, to, to Turkey. So President Clinton persuaded the bill sponsor to drop it. This proves that the airbase that they talk about in their case was used as an excuse to commit genocide, meaning that we have multiple links into genocide if anything you're probably voting on here on strength of length because they drop it in um summary thus negate
Okay. Order is going to be on framing. Then, okay, yeah. Framing, our case, their case. Okay. Anybody not ready? Start off on the framing, both sides impact a genocide. They say we need to reject any institution that perpetrates genocide. But when you reject the IMF, you reject the very institution that prevented genocide from happening in the first place. Insofar as voting for their side means you're create, allowing this genocide to happen, then both sides linked in the framework. At the end of the day, you can only look to Wing when we're going to talk about scope. That's going to be on our case. On our third contention about Baltics, this is the cleanest place for you to vote. You keep on giving these very poor responses that are flowed through ink. We're telling you that Russia wanted to destroy Eastern Europe because of ethnic tensions. That's really key because they had the means to do so. They had a nuclear weapon. There's your power imbalance. As for the moral thing, they wanted to take out these ethnicities. There's your genocide if they don't want to believe it. However, the reason why Russia wasn't able to do this was because the IMF helped these Eastern European countries become more liberal, liberalize their trade, and that's what allowed them to join NATO. Under NATO, the United States can protect them with their nuclear weapons. All of this link goes uncontested the entire round. And that's really key because on Russia, they, if they were allowed to create this nuclear war, then there would be 100 million people who are dying. This outweighs on scope because any number they give you, even with Turkey, doesn't outweigh it. Now, here are their responses. First, they say the World Bank would have done it. They extend this through ink. We tell you the World Bank literally wasn't even in Eastern Europe at the time. They also said countries don't want to go to war because of mad. We also tell you in rebuttal why MAD doesn't apply, because these Eastern European countries didn't have nukes to begin with, so Russia would be doing a first strike, not a miscalculation. At the end of the day, we're still impacting a genocide because Russia had the intent to take out these countries. And even if you don't want to believe that, why is having a moral intention making murder of 100 million people better or worse? Well, let's go on their case. They lose because of so, so many feelings. Their main response is that the World Bank didn't have a lending institution. We don't need the IMF to lend money to the entire world. There's regional banks such as the African Development Bank, which they drop. Their card also tell you the World Bank does it. Our story 01 tells you that the World Bank was responsible for these loans. And insofar as the army already had weapons to begin with, it's not like taking out the IMF would have stopped it. At the end of the day, here's why you're waiting for us. If you vote for them, this genocide still happens because there's so many alternative causes. But when you vote for us, you can prove with 100% probability that we did not see a genocide of Eastern Europe. You should vote for us on Clarity of Link because we give you much more uniqueness as to why the IMF can stop genocide, whereas on their side, they can't even prove that it contributed. Good round, y'all. Good round. Good round, you guys. Congratulations on making it this far, no matter what happens after this round. That's a giant, like, congratulations. It's very exciting, especially at a tournament like TOC. Okay, I'm gonna run to the bathroom really quick, but I'll be as fast as I can.
All right, it looks like the decision is complete. Um, I'm seeing it on my screen. Other judges are you as well? Um, not yet, but I can look. Yeah, it's on my screen too. Awesome. Um, all right, I can announce it. First, I wanna say again, phenomenal debate. Like this was an amazing debate. Um, and before anything else, like everybody should be unbelievably proud of making it to semis uh, at the TSC. Um, and that debate was unreal. So incredible job all around. Um, with that being said, the decision was a 2-1 for the pro. Um, I sat so I can explain first why I ended up voting for the con. Um, I think like, to me, it comes down to framework. I think throughout the round, like genocide is agreed to be the most important issue because of this like cyclical nature. So what country, you're like, who can show that IMF promotes or doesn't promote genocide in the clearest way ends up winning? Um, once I look at that, I think it comes down to like this Rwanda argument versus the nuclear war argument in the Baltics. Um, I think Rwanda, while it's not unique, that non uniqueing ends up not mattering that much because through that framework debate, um, Khan really effectively proves that like, even if it's not unique, as long as the IMF through Rwanda is promoting genocide, um, it becomes a reason to negate because of these future harms. Um, so I think that that's a pretty clear link, even though I think that like most of the non-uniqueness claims hold for the most part. Um, then it gets into this nuclear war uh, sort of contention. I think for the most part, a lot of the responses don't hold. Um, I think it's pretty unique why like nuclear war will happen. What I end up voting for though, is how that links back to genocide because everybody ends up agreeing that like how you link back into genocide is the most important thing. I don't think pro for my ballot necessarily proves why this nuclear conflict is distinctly a genocide. Um, I think the impact still hold, but how it ends up looking back to that framework debate and the cyclical future nature doesn't necessarily hold enough. Um, I think there's some discussion of it potentially being an ethnic conflict, but across my flow, I don't see enough evidence as to why that holds for me to distinctly classify through that framework um, in enough of a way for me to feel comfortable. I think it could, without this framework, potentially outweigh, um, but because everybody kind of defaults back to this framework, I end up going with the negative. Um, but again, phenomenal round overall. Yeah, I'm going to second everything that Judge Giovanelli, is that how you pronounce it? Okay, cool. Um, I second everything that he said. Um, you guys both did a really excellent job. I did end up voting for the pro. And interestingly, a lot of my reasoning was the same as um, my fellow judge, but uh, I ended up on the other side of the coin. Um, partially because I really don't, I, I really agree with the, um, with the pros argument that the cons, most of their, uh, their arguments were non-unique. I also feel like, um, the con could have flowed through the Rwanda argument better. I think that it kind of, it took less, there was less focus on that than there was on, particularly, it was frustrating to hear so much of the squabbling about, um, the differences between genocide and mass murder, like, nuclear war, like I, I don't really think that that mattered at the end of the day. Um, I don't think that that semantics debate was helpful. Um, but I really thought that you guys both did a wonderful job. It was really the non-uniqueness and also the fact that um, there wasn't, I, the pro mentioned that there was no solvency in the con and I agree with pro. Um, so I think that that's why, that's really what it boiled down to for me. Um, a couple of other things, you guys are all really excellent speakers. Um, and this is something that I've said to almost all of the teams that I've judged in this debate, especially for the Silver League, for the Silver group, um, which I think is like the JV, am I right there? Like as opposed to the gold, I don't know. Um, but either way, um, I think that everybody could do well to remember to school your expressions and composure as much as possible. Um, I noticed that um, Doherty, they just told me last round how to pronounce it. Daughtery, da how do you pronounce your name? Doherty. <laughs> Doherty, okay. Doherty, you did a really great job of that. You guys maintained your composure. Riverdale, you guys could have maintained your composure a little bit better. I know that it's really hard because you want to react and it's hard to like not make your emotions show on your face, but that's something that I would practice on. That's something that I had a really hard time with when I was debating um, because you know, you want to be like, what is this guy saying? But um, it doesn't reflect well. And I think that it's just good generally to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, you guys are both really excellent debaters or both teams are really excellent. Um, the skills that you guys are learning and growing here are going to serve you well for the rest of your lives. Um, and I wish you guys all of the best um, for the rest of the competition and for the rest of your debating career and, and beyond. So great job, everybody.
Um, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm going to third what everyone said. Um, it's kind of hard being the third person because it's like, oh, you're just going to copy what everyone else is saying. Basically, um, it was really close for me. I actually had conned the majority of the debate. And then I think the last two speeches I switched to pro. And I just felt that I felt that it was just. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, basically, I just felt that. Well, genocide was going to happen in either world. I felt that it was so it was just non unique. I felt that the pro did a better job at like utilizing their information and evidence and explaining it in a way that made me more persuaded to pick them. Um, let me get my notes up. I also felt that like exactly what the last judge said, the semantics debate, I didn't really care when it came down to that because either or people were dying and that's bad. Inherently people dying is bad. So it doesn't matter if it's genocide or mass murder, it's, it's death. Um, this was really hard. See, this is the one thing I hate about judging, especially things like this. I feel like both debaters, like both teams should have won, but unfortunately I, I did side with Crow. So great job to everyone. I wish I was as good as uh, of a debater as you all are, but thank you. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for judging. Thank good you. luck in finals, y'all. Yeah, good luck. Great. Good luck, y'all.